crossing borders. It's not only a fitting theme for me here in Berlin as an American, it's not only a fitting theme for me because I was a diplomat and logged hundreds of thousands of miles flying around the world for Secretary Hillary Clinton. I actually crossed borders through my whole career. I started my career as an activist, not as a government official, at an organization called Free Press, which was founded in 2003 with the idea that we needed to bring together grassroots organizing and Washington lobbying to try to make the, the media more democratic, to try to make sure the internet stayed open and free, to try to make sure that the ownership of media did not become too consolidated, and try to make sure that democratic societies have more quality journalism to inform citizens. Simple idea and one that became very popular. And over the course of about six years, we built a movement of 500,000 people and a team of about two dozen economists and lawyers and lobbyists in Washington who pushed the case to lawmakers about why the media should change for the better. It was such a successful operation that in 2007, I received an invitation to join a political campaign as an advisor on technology policy, and I weighed the options, and I thought, well, should I do this, should I not do this? And I decided to do it, and that turned out to be a pretty, pretty good decision. <laughs> and I worked on the campaign uh, as an advisor to President Obama, and that won me a job with this lady, Hillary Clinton, at the State Department. And my job at the State Department was to think about how the internet changes foreign policy and more particularly how the power of networks impacts international relations and how diplomats need to respond to that. But my talk is not about my story. My talk is about what I learned as a diplomat. My talk is about how I watched America's Foreign Service go from internet skeptics to internet alarmists. My talk is about how we in the U.S. government learned that the internet is not something over here to the side of politics, it's something right in the center of how political power works. And if, if no one could teach us how to do this, this guy did. Julian Assange and WikiLeaks and Cablegate showed us how a mountain of paper that would take a truck to drive out of the State Department could be loaded onto 10,000 computers around the world in a matter of hours. The power of networks. And if we wanted a better wake-up call than WikiLeaks, we saw it with the Arab Spring and the power of social media to catalyze and accelerate political movements. But it's not just happening in the Arab world. We saw it here in Europe. We saw it with the ACTA protests. We saw tens of thousands of young people here in the streets of Germany marching to protest against an obscure trade agreement that no one had ever heard of. We see it in China, where 300 million microbloggers are becoming an increasingly organized community of dissent. And we see it when fools and bigots make YouTube videos that cause riots with violence and death. What I want to tell you about here is not that the internet causes revolutions. It doesn't. The internet doesn't even <laughs> make, it doesn't even guarantee that your movement is going to be successful. It doesn't even show that it's going to be democratic or autocratic or anything in between. Network power in politics simply enables the desires of its users. What I want to start you out with today is that the internet is a political force that's here to stay. There are two billion people connected to the network today. That number will double over the next few years. What that means is that network power is real and we're going to deal with it for quite some time. So here's what my talk is going to be about, three things. My father was a preacher and he told me, never try to say more than three things in any one talk. And the third thing has to be about why people should care about the first two things, so I'm following his rules. So the first thing is power. And I want to unpack that a little bit and I want to Focus your mind on two questions about the power of the internet in politics. Question number one, why is the internet different? Why is it different than any other previous change in mass media? Why is the internet different than when television became the dominant media form around the world? And the second question I'm going to get to is how the power of the internet changes political views, how it changes political behavior, because that's really where the rubber meets the road. So I'm going to start getting at this question of how the internet is different by introducing you to Tom. 
Tom is an internet user just, just like, like you. you. And Tom's on Facebook, probably just like you. And Tom does a variety of things on Facebook, just like you. He talks to his friends and family and shares photographs. And Tom catches up on the news. He's got an RSS feed in the New York Times. And Tom has a couple of YouTube channels that are integrated into his page so he can keep track of his favorite music videos. And occasionally, Tom even clicks on one of those annoying ads and buys something or pays to participate in a Facebook game. What Tom is, is typical. And in his typicalness, Tom actually shows us why the internet is so different and so powerful. Because what Tom has just done on one screen of his Facebook page is use all three information networks that sit underneath modern societies. So imagine that Tom's sitting at his computer and he invites in all of his relatives, his parents, his grandparents, and his great-grandparents, and they're talking about how they use information systems, and they're talking about the three major information systems of modern societies, personal communications, and the information system of our economy, and the mass media. Well, Tom's relatives would say, well, back in the day, if I wanted to talk to my nephew, I took out a piece of paper and wrote a letter and put it in the mail. And after that, we had the telegraph, and then we had the telephone, but now we're using the internet. And with our economy, it used to be that the information system of our economy was the same network that took goods back and forth between buyers and consumers. It was the shipping lanes, it was the railroads, it was the highways and the skyways. But now, the information system of our economy is the internet. And mass media, Tom's relative, used to open up the newspaper, turn on the radio, watch television. Now it's all online. The three major information systems of modern societies have converged on a single network. And that's powerful. That's disruptive. That gives Tom the power to do all kinds of things that he used to need to ask permission for. Tom's not just a Facebook user like you. Tom's a blogger. And Tom hangs out on 4chan when nobody's watching. And Tom makes his techno music in his spare time. And he's thinking about starting a business because he's good at it. And Tom moderates a political forum online for members of his political party who live in his city. And Tom, unlike his parents or grandparents who might have wanted to do some of these things, asked permission from exactly no one to do any of it. What that means is that Tom, sitting at his computer, has the power to be a political actor on the state, on the federal, and on the international level like no other time in history. It's changing power dynamics. Not all at once, and not everywhere in the same ways, but what we're seeing is a trend. And that trend is power going from centralized authority, like governments and conventional institutions of media power, like broadcasters and cable operators, and that power is being distributed to individuals and networks of individuals. And what's happening is that governments are losing control of the information system. What, what I learned at the State Department is that we're losing control and we're not getting it back. And it's time to deal with that fact. It's time to understand it. So now that we know a little bit more about why the internet is different, let's talk about how the internet and the power of the internet in political movements changes views, changes people's political ideas, changes their actions. The way that it does that is something that scholars have studied for decades, the effect of media on political behavior. And for about 60 years, social scientists have had a pretty good model about how to predict the impact of media on political outcomes. The internet, because it's not just mass media, it's a triple paradigm of personal communications, economic communications, and mass media, blows up that model. And we're gonna see how. We're gonna see how with a little bit of past meets present. And let's start with the past. The past begins with a guy named Paul Lazarsfeld. Paul Lazarsfeld was an immigrant from Austria, he moved to the United States in the 1930s, and set up one of the first communications research centers in the world at Columbia. And what Lazarsfeld was interested in was the impact of radio, then the dominant mass media form, on political outcomes. And so he conducted a very famous study in, of the, uh, in 1940 of the presidential election in the United States. And what he found was very frustrating. 
What he found was that the impact of political advertising and political messages in the mainstream media on actual voting behavior appeared to be zero. That makes no sense. And so they repeated the experiment for years, and they got the same result over and over and over. And after a while, they said, this can't be, the, this can't be true. It can't be true that people don't change their mind based on the impact of the media. There must be something else going on here. How do people change their political views? And they came up with a model called the two-step flow. Only an academic could come up with that term. <laughs> the two-step flow looks like this. It begins with an agenda setting. The media tells us what to think about, but not how to feel about it. The people who tell us how to feel about it are the people who we talk to and who we trust. Think about how you make political decisions. You don't open the newspaper and think, oh, well, that guy who just written that article is probably right. I think I'm going to change my mind. You change your political views by saying to your wife or your husband over the dinner table, what did you think about that article? You change your mind based on conversations you have in the bar room or around the water cooler at the office or at a social club or over drinks with friends. We change our mind based on the people in our lives who are influencing our political decisions. And so what Lazarus Feld found, the two-step flow, is that the media set the agenda and they influence people who influence us and we change our minds in interpersonal interaction. So let's go back to Tom. Let's go back to you on Facebook. Let's think about the two-step flow. I'm looking at the mass media. I see something that's interesting to me. Does it change my mind? Well, that, how, how can I have a conversation about that with my friends? I don't have to wait till tonight when we're in the bar to remember about the article that I read. I see that article in the New York Times and I think, oh, that's interesting. Share. Just like that. Two-step flow, broken down in about three seconds. That's powerful. That's, that's a major change in the way that political power operates. What's interesting about it is, in Lazarus Fell's day, we could only hypothesize that these intermediaries existed, that these influential people in our trust communities were there. The data showed that they were there, but we couldn't see them. Now we can see them. We use services like Clout. Clout is a data analytics company that takes a combination of social media data and crowdsource scoring, and they identify the people on Twitter who are influential. They are Lazarsfeldian influencers, even if they're not called that by the people at Cloud. Okay, so what, Professor? <laughs> what does this tell us about the real world? Well, let's think about the Arab revolutions. Let's think about the so-called leaderless movements that swept the Maghreb. They actually weren't leaderless. They were full of leaders. They were full of influencers, people who are influential in their trust communities, whether they were union leaders or school leaders or bartenders with a community that came to their, their, their establishment on a regular basis. These are people who are able to mobilize their communities offline. And when you have a movement of those influencers who are all connected online and they're influencing people offline, quickly you can accelerate a political protest. But don't look for charismatic leaders like Václav Havel. You won't find them. Don't look for the leaders of traditional political institutions like labor unions, like Lech Walesa in Poland. You won't find them. What you will find are Lazarsfeldian influencers behind masks. People who you know, who you see every day, who are influential because you communicate them, with them in your everyday life. What's different about what's happening now is that the number of trust communities that we participate in has multiplied dramatically because we're on Facebook, because we're following a Twitter hashtag, because we're checking out Tumblr, because we're on 4chan. All of these have the potential to be influential trust communities where there are people who clout can identify who influence our behavior. And those people tend not only to be influential online, they tend to be influential offline. So what does that look like? Let's think about Egypt again. Egypt has about 25% of its population using the internet, and 25% of its population that is illiterate. 15% of Egyptians use social media on a regular basis. Now, 15% doesn't sound like enough of the population to be so influential in a political movement, but they are. 
So influential, in fact, that when the Supreme Council of the Allied Armed Forces took power after the fall of Mubarak, what did they do? They started a Facebook page to make their announcements to pay credit to the influence of that medium. But before you accuse me of being a cyber utopian, let's talk about the limits of the power of the internet on political movements, because there are limits and they're real. And the limits happen because of the natural way these movements form. So when I've got a movement that, are, that is led by nodes of a network of these influence communities, of school groups and union leaders and religious groups and political parties, and they're organized against something, they're very strong because they only have to be united on one thing. We don't like that. But when that is gone, and all of these different communities have to come together around the common vision of what happens next, they can't. They begin to dissipate. And governments watching these movements, fearful of them, take advantage of this weakness. We can see it in Iran. We can see one of the most sophisticated surveillance uh, systems in the world. Identifying the influencers, persecuting them, throwing them in jail, eliminating that pattern of the two-step flow. Russia, same way, bloggers, social media activists, off the streets, into the courtroom. Another way governments treat this is by simply ignoring it, waiting for it to go away. Where are the young people in Tahrir Square represented in President Morsi's government in Egypt? They're not. What is the response of the mainstream political parties in Germany to the rise of the pirates? Let me tell you, they're hoping the Piraten will simply go away. And they could be right. If they're not, they might take a third approach, which we see in the United States, which is appropriation. The Republican Party took a look at the Tea Party, one of the most successful online movements in politics in history, and said, we'll have that. And they just brought it right in under the, their institution and they appropriated that power. So what? Uh, so why should you care about this? Why should this be important to you sitting here today? Well, I want to leave you with two things and I want to start with this. The power of the internet as a force in political movements is here to stay. Two billion people and counting are online. In a year's time, the majority of those people will be in the developing world, on a mobile phone, not on a home computer. And even in those countries that have successfully resisted the power of network-fueled political movements, even in those countries, I predict they will return. They will return because repression cannot stop the desire for change. It can only delay it. And the power of the internet has reduced the time it takes for those change movements to cycle back around. That's why I think the great ideological conflict of the first half of the 21st century will not be left versus right, it will not be global south versus global north, it will be open versus closed. And on that sweep of history, I think each and every one of us should take an interest in how the power of the internet works in politics. And if you're so inclined, you should take action and learn how to use it. Because I promise you this, if you don't, somebody else will. Thank you very much.